It looks such a straightforward place from the outside. Too much so for me, really. A bit plain. And it seems that way inside too, to begin with. You walk through the nave, which is quite short, because when it was built there were few people who used it, only visitors and onlookers. The real business of the Abbey, the worship and glorification of God, done elsewhere, through these gates. This is the choir, and ahead is the sanctuary and the high altar. But beyond that there seems to be another chapel, and some sort of ramparts beyond that. Unlike the nave, the choir is long, as it had to be to accommodate the whole of the monastic community, which seven or eight times a day gathered here to sing and worship. This was the hub of Westminster Abbey. There's no going up the altar steps, and instead one goes round the side, where there are more gates and tombs at every turn, a cemetery in fact. Though it's also not unlike walking round the outside deck of a liner, the high altar, the sanctuary and the shrine like the bridge and the engine room somewhere in the middle until you come up these unexpected steps and past yet more elaborate gates into the prow of the abbey and its tremendous surprise the Lady Chapel, the Chapel of Henry VII. It was finished around 1512 the last great flowering of medieval Christianity. And seeing it now, grey as a shin bone, it's hard to imagine that then every inch of it was painted and gilded, and the windows bright with coloured glass. But scarcely had the builders carted away their rubble and the painters taken down their scaffolding when the medieval church was split apart. The Reformation had begun, and abbeys such as this faced ruin. Within a few years, Henry VIII had closed down the monasteries, taken over their lands, carted away the furniture and fittings, and the remains were left to decay and gather dust. Today, we think the destruction at the Reformation was shocking, criminal. But I don't know. The secular side of the Reformation, and certainly the dissolution of the monasteries, ought to be more readily understandable to us in the 1990s than at any time in the last 400 years. What happened to the monasteries, after all, was simply a process of privatisation. Their lands and assets sold off at a quick short-term profit for the government, the beneficiaries largely those who were well disposed to the regime, and the monks, the employees, most of them made redundant. Well, it's more or less what happens today. And had the Abbey been anywhere else but at Westminster, Henry VIII's commissioners would have come in, taken away the gold and precious stones, stripped the lead off the roof, and left the rest to nature and market forces. Which is, after all, what happened at Fountains Abbey and Kirkstall, Revo. But then, they weren't the burial place of kings. Queen Victoria sat in the chair twice, 
Firstly in 1837 in her crown and all her regalia at the coronation, then 50 years later at her jubilee in her little white bonnet and black dress. Anybody could sit here in the 18th century, provided they tipped the verger, and they could also wield Edward III's seven-foot sword of state, which used to stand beside it. While not quite stripped pine, it suits our present-day fad for natural surfaces, but when it was first made, around 1300, it was wholly gilded and painted, and covered in semi-precious stones and beads, and must have looked as much fairground as Gothic, perhaps even a bit common. What has brought it down to its present tasteful state is time, and a series of terrible indignities. A suffragette's bomb that exploded at the back of it, the brief theft of the stone in 1950 by Scottish nationalists. George IV sawed off all the crockets, and the Victorians varnished it so heavily that most of the original paintwork was destroyed. Generations of Westminster schoolboys have carved their names on it, including one boy who slept in it one night in 1800 and left a message on the seat to say so. It was someone in Victorian times who added the lions, but they needn't have bothered. It's such a familiar stick of national furniture, battered and handed down, and the monarchy nowadays so anxious not to be remote, they could have dispensed with the lions and just put it on rockers. Once upon a time, the monks would rise at three to say prime, the first office of the day. Devotions nowadays begin at seven, with half an hour silent prayer in St Faith's Chapel, followed by the saying of matins. While anyone may come to this service, it's most frequently attended by those who work in and around the Abbey, the Abbey family. When I first heard the Dean use this phrase, I cynically took it as one of those wishful sentiments we use nowadays in an attempt to cosify the world. I was quite wrong. Call the whole company together. They dressed him in purple, and plaiting a crown of thorns, placed it on his head. Then they began to salute him. The Abbey family has been an active notion for 50 years now, and the more one sees of this place and the people who work here, clergy, guides, builders, electricians, it seems just a statement of fact. It is a family. Then they led him out to crucify him. They're using the revised English Bible and not the old authorised version, which ought not to matter to me, but does a bit. Though who am I to say, I'm just an eavesdropper. The passers-by wagged their heads and jeered at him. Bravo, they said. So you are the man who pulled down the temple and rebuild it in three days? Save yourself and come down from the cross. Try that again so we get it bang in the middle of the note. Let's look at that first verse. I will lift up mine eyes into the hills. From whence cometh my help? Now what does that second line really mean? Any ideas? I don't know. At the boy's age, I probably thought that the hills were where to look for the arrival of the US cavalry.
holy, 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 Lord God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Glory be to thee, O Lord most high. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your heart. Two. Phrase. Breath. Four. Two. Oh, that's quite all right. Just the sort of thing. It's very tempting to put an extra little note in there. Let's go from the end of the top second line and we'll just see if we can get that right. That's why we rehearse it, isn't it, sometimes? So it's nice to have the mistakes then rather than later. All got it, the last bar of the second line. Three, four. It's only half past eight, but in the chapel of the Picts, the Dean is already taking the second service of the day, the Eucharist. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. The body of Christ. The Abbey is what is called a royal peculiar, set apart by its charter from the ordinary jurisdiction of the Church of England, with the Dean answerable not to the Archbishop of Canterbury, but directly to the Sovereign. So this is the Queen's Parish Church. But it's also the Chapel of Westminster School, and three times a week, and before they're open to visitors, the choir and transepts fill up with boys and girls for the school's morning chapel. Good morning. There will be Compline this evening. If you want to go to it, meet me under Little's Arch at five to nine. We begin this act of worship with hymn number 372, He Who Would Valiant Be, 372. Boring hymns, except if they're lucky they'll remember them all their lives. And undiscouraged and unrelenting in they come, the tribes of Nike and Adidas and Reebok. I'm not sure Jesus would have approved. How much is the fat? It's Russell Square. Well, we've been all around that anyhow. Where's Marks and Spencer's? The tenth chapter, the twenty-third verse. <laughs> and Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again, and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? 
It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When they're old, will they remember these mornings in the abbey, scanning the stalls for a particular face? Will hymns bring it back, or the smell of cold stone and the voluntary? As the tourists wait to troop in, the school troops out. Even at 9.15 in the morning, these Westminster boys and girls armoured in their careful languor. What was all that eye of the needle stuff? Didn't apply to us, did it, James? No. And anyway, we are clever. Well, as I say, Westminster Abbey is a royal peculiar church and it is run by the Dean and Chapter. And it's the Dean now, who is the, our present Dean is the uh, Reverend uh, Michael Main. He's very sort of important Dean because he's answerable to one person and that's the visitor uh, of the Queen. Uh, but this being a special and a royal peculiar church, it's uh, entirely self-funding. We rely very much, of course, on yourselves coming here because it costs around about £4 million uh, to uh, run Westminster Abbey per year. Uh, we don't uh, receive any state aid or any aid from the church. One needs to remember that, like Venice, the Abbey has always been a venue for tourists. In its earliest days, pilgrims would come to look at the Confessor's shrine and view the relics. And pilgrims are, after all, simply tourists on their knees. We've run out of space, literally. There are 3,000 people buried in this church. There are 400 monuments in here as well. So we bury our kings and queens at Windsor now. We've also had a number of royal weddings here. Again, an embarrassing subject, but I think the Queen married here. She's still with Prince Philip, so that wedding was in here. And just very briefly tell you a little bit about the history of this church. There has actually been a church on this site since the 7th century. And what I said, like a shoal of fish. So they don't bury people here in Westminster Abbey anymore. Uh, all they do now is inter ashes here. And uh, the ashes of Lawrence Olivier, so I think, about the last ashes to be turred right in uh, Westminster Abbey. Are we all met? Just about. I brought you into the nave of a church whose history goes back probably to the early part of the 7th century, the early 600s. The first church of any real importance here was under a king of England when we used to have seven kings and seven kingdoms, King Offa, who actually endowed a church here in 785. But the first truly important church was after the last Anglo-Saxon king. Now Anglo-Saxon is what we were before the Battle of Hastings and the invasion of William of Normandy. And that king was called King Edward the Confessor because he was a very pious religious man who prayed a lot. As a royal burial place, Westminster is unique. The only comparable spot, the Abbey of Saint-Denis in Paris, where the French kings are buried. The French Revolution put paid to that. Fifty royal tombs broken up in as many hours. Two days to destroy the work of 12 centuries. Nothing comparable happened here. And when Henry VIII's commissioners went into the monasteries and stripped them of their assets, Westminster largely survived preserved because so many royal dead lie round. The most remarkable survival is the shrine itself. And in it, just about here, the body of Edward the Confessor. Saint, founder of the Abbey, the last of the Saxon kings who died in 1066. Other shrines were not so lucky. Henry VIII destroyed virtually all of them. 
including St. Cuthbert's at Durham, where he chucked out the body and stripped the place, St. Albans, and the richest shrine of all, that of Thomas a Becket at Canterbury. But not Edward the Confessor. And here, though robbed of all its finery, is his battered stone box still. Now why? Well, not because he was a saint, obviously. No, it was because he was a king, and Henry VIII was a king. And there's a trade union of kings. Injure one, you injure them all. Saint or sinner, Catholic or Protestant, kings and queens stick together. So when, with the death of the young Edward VI and the accession of Mary, Catholicism was briefly re-established, the shrine, minus most of its accoutrements, was rebuilt. The lower part, still as Henry III had built it in the 1260s, the upper part dating from Mary's time, 300 years later. Here in these niches, hollowed out by 500 years of knees, pilgrims would pray and touch the stone, some even lying here all through the night. To most Anglicans, certainly, the idea of a shrine is strange and exotic, and there is something not altogether English about it, even now, after 600 years. The upper stage is looking somehow Greek, or like an elaborate doll's house. And right until the end of the 18th century, a strange, almost unbelievable fact, the area around the shrine was swept daily and the sweeping sent off with whatever sacred dust they contained to Catholic Spain and Portugal. We pass to the north aisle. I have it yet. Ahead of you, metal, no wait a minute, here we go. This way is north, we're headed east. But this used to be the royal burial place. There were 2,000 people buried in this church. They're like sardines, <laughs> side by side. Don't look so worried, I'm not going to tell you about all of them. But we have to go right back to the year 600 when a church was first built on this site. And there were no other buildings around here whatsoever. We were just on a little island called Thorny Island. Space, or prime space, near the altar or the shrine, has always been at a premium. And there's something of an old garden about it sometimes, nobody keeping an accurate record of who's been planted where. So quite often, someone has been dug up or had to be relocated. There's no plan or pattern to burial in the Abbey. You elbowed your way in where you could, and some of the side chapels in particular are a bit of a jumble. They're rather like some specialised left luggage office. Tombs shoved in like trunks, waiting to be redeemed at the resurrection. And space was always limited, and even when you bagged a place, you weren't sure of hanging on to it. In this tomb are some of the children of Henry III and Edward I. They were nicely tucked up in a spot in the shrine, and then found themselves booted out and put down here because Richard II fancied the same spot for the tomb of his wife. Sorry, change of plan. Hope you don't mind, I'm putting you in the spare room. It took 20 years to start worrying about that fact, right? So naturally the Pope wouldn't have it. The king was most annoyed and promptly divorced himself from the Pope instead. He made himself the head of the Church of England. Good, isn't it? He could do anything he liked. He did. He divorced Catherine and married Anne Boleyn. And ever since that day, the king, or now the Queen of England, is the head of the Church of England. And she appoints the dean and the chapter to this church, who only answer directly to the Queen of England, not via any bishops. The dean of Westminster Abbey is a very powerful man. To be honest, he only answers to two, the Queen and the Almighty. And please don't ask me in what order. I've had a letter this morning, Ken, from a Roman Catholic church in Zimbabwe, uh, actually uh, St. Edward the Confessors, and they've written to us because their church is falling down, uh, mm -hmm. wanting some money with lots of photographs and things, and you can see in some of these that, in fact, 
there are quite bad uh, cracks in the church here and, and down here and again there it's very clear so they very they obviously are worried it's something to do with land erosion which has happened rather fast so I think we might well support them 12 pounds I guess thank you not yet. We need to get four on the town town points from June followers. Good morning. Thank you. I don't like churches charging or even shaming visitors into making supposedly voluntary offerings. But at least at Westminster it has the sanction of history. The monks were charging pilgrims to see the shrine and the tombs in the 15th century. And besides, the Church of England gives the Abbey no income. One pound change. And take a look for it from over there. Italian? Espanol? Thank you. More famous for founding the Metropolitan Police Force. At that time they were nicknamed the Peelers, after his surname. And today we sometimes refer to police as Bobbies. That is why. It's from his name, Robert. The next chap along, looking very austere and solemn, is William Ewart Gladstone. He was Prime Minister four times in the last century. He wasn't a bundle of laughs. In fact, uh, every Tuesday our Prime Minister goes and has a meeting with the Queen. The same thing happened in the last century. He wasn't very good at dealing with the ladies, Gladstone. Well, some of us have that problem, don't we? Oh, maybe you don't. Um, I do, I'm afraid. But uh, Gladstone, when he went to see the Queen, if she invited him to sit down, he couldn't. He was so nervous. And I'll just break off because every hour on the hour, we stop and we say a prayer to remind us this is a house of God. It's not simply a museum. And that's going to happen now. All our visitors to join with us in one minute of stillness, silence and prayer. Une minute de silence et de recueillement, s'il vous plaît. Bitte, eine minute stille und gebet. I ask you, therefore, to be still, sitting or standing as you prefer, while we remember God, to whose glory this great church was built. And let us remember also those less fortunate than ourselves. We pray for this great abbey, for all who work in it and serve it, not only as a tourist attraction, but as a place of worship, prayer, and pastoral care. have always been cliquey. It's part of their charm, or their lack of it, and the burial and memorial customs of the Abbey contrive to make them as cliquey in death as they are in life. The most obvious clique being the writers and poets gathered here in Poets' Corner. But all over the Abbey are similar groupings, little knots of the like-minded. Architects in one corner, scientists in another engineers, musicians, even Sir John Franklin, the polar explorer, has found someone similar to keep him warm. It's the English liking for clubs. And of course it means that when the last trump sounds and the dead begin to clamber out of their graves, there won't be any awkward standing about like there is at the start of a party. Everybody will have somebody to talk to. Henry III can enjoy a joke with Charles II. Darwin can bring Newton up to date on the latest developments. It'll all be very relaxed. Of course, a lot of them will be talking shop, but that's the English idea of heaven anyway. But then there will be other monuments, important 
ven encima de Shakespeare los medallones dedicados a Kids y a Shelley, poetas famosos. A la derecha de Shakespeare ven esa placa conmemorativa dedicada a la semana. Together with the coronation chair and the tomb of the unknown warrior, Hoyt's Corner is the most famous feature of the Abbey. And once upon a time, it would be the first glimpse you would get of the interior. But in the 19th century, visitors came in by this door. And it was the door which, in 1820, the wretched and rejected, drunken and unwashed Queen Caroline was refused admission to the coronation of her husband, George IV. The first poet to be buried here was honoured not because he was a poet, but because he was a civil servant. This was Chaucer, who had been in the household of John of Gaunt and Richard II. The original tomb of the author of the Canterbury Tales was behind the postcard counter. His bones were brought over here in 1556 and put in this splendid tomb which was probably looted from one of the monasteries dissolved by Henry VIII. Vamos a salir. Nos quedan cinco minutos si alguien quería comprar alguna postal. Si no salimos por esta puerta, al frente verán las casas del Parlamento y a la derecha estarán los autocares en cinco minutos esperando. ¿De acuerdo? De acuerdo. I've got mixed feelings about Poets Corner. It's associated in my mind with Christopher Robin and the changing of the guard, Peter Pan, even Pearly Kings and a gore-blimey strike-alike of tourist board notion of England. It's English literature safe and cosified. Doubting Thomas and St Christopher, dated 13th century. Over here, of course, we've got some more famous names. You've got the very famous Charles Dickens, buried here on the instructions of Queen Victoria. Rudyard Kipling, Children's Tales, Jungle Book, etc. Thomas Hardy, another great name. And of course, I always... The English prefer their poets dead and respectable. And so many of the writers buried or remembered here are safer in death than they ever were in life. The atheist Shelley would be shocked to find himself here, and Keats too, probably. It was Harold Nicholson who was instrumental in getting their monument put up, and he was nervous lest it might look like a sausage, which it does a bit. Orton, like Shelley, might find himself a bit uneasy about being here. He left England because it was too cosy, went to live in America. And now here he is, commemorated in the Abbey's coziest corner. And here are the first war poets. And a pretty odd bunch they are. It's only because they're safely dead that you can include on the same stone Julian Grenfell, who thought war was a great big adventure, and Wilfred Owen, who was, well, more pessimistic. And this is Wordsworth, he was actually buried in Grasmere. He's rather less lonely as a cloud in Poet's Corner and in some rather odd company. Joshua Ward, who invented Fry's Balsam. The botanist Stephen Hales, who also dreamed up the ventilator. Oh, and he's lost his pen. It's a small act of vandalism. And it's comforting to think it was probably committed in the 19th century. But this place has always had its share of prying, prizing fingers, scratching and picking and breaking off. Tomb robbers we associate with ancient Egypt, except that here, in our own Valley of the Kings, there has been a process of patient and persistent larceny that has been going on virtually since the Abbey was built. A finger broken off here, a precious stone dug out there. Pilgrims who come to see the relics and take away a relic with them. These days the worst vandals are acknowledged to be French schoolchildren. 
tadpoles, as the vergers call them. French children seem to long to make their mark, generally on one of our national monuments. Probably the most beautiful feature of the south transept, which houses Poets' Corner, are these 13th century wall paintings, which were discovered quite by accident during the preparations for the coronation of Edward VIII, which turned into that of George VI. This is the incredulity of St Thomas, putting his hand into the side of Christ. Writers deal in doubts rather than certainties, and it's a nice accident that this picture of the most famous of doubters should be revealed as the background to so many memorials of the literary life. On two mornings a week, the choristers entertain visitors in the nave with what they call the Sing. This morning, it's Litany to the Holy Spirit by Peter Herford. What's moving about a choir is to see boys of nine or ten doing something they can do supremely well with all the seriousness and dedication one thinks of as coming with age. The dogs will be in at 08.30, there's only two dogs and we'll do a physical search at 0900 so we won't be clear of the Abbey much before 9.15. Now, what about our royal representatives? There are two, the Queen and the Prince of Wales, and they will arrive after the Lord Mayor of Westminster, who arrives at 10.50. What about Archie Parshall Greg? Who arrive just before the Lord Mayor. Any questions? Now, let's have a look at the first circle. O.J., tell me what the first circle is on the instructions. Radius one. I'm going to get my pencil from my bag. You see, they all end in the same sort of ending. It's Chester, Exeter. Hmm? Exeter. We've got Exeter up there, Peter. Leicester. Leicester. Well, Leicester itself, not the county, but the city of Leicester. We're looking for these endings. Not Westminster, no. Westminster means the minster or the church in the west. It's nothing to do with the Romans. The Romans were never here in Westminster. Ready troops? March. <laughs> and so we are known as a Royal Peculiar. And the Archbishop of Canterbury has no say whatsoever about Westminster Abbey. And in fact, he has to wait for an invitation or ask permission to take a service here. And the only time he can come into this Abbey without permission to take a service is when we have a coronation. And that's the only time because he, as leader of the Church of England, has the right to uh, come and crown the head of the Church of England. So I don't want this modern paving stone marks the spot where the playwright Ben Johnson is buried. 
and against the wall is the original gravestone with his name misspelled. I don't know much about Ben Johnson, except that he was more one of the boys than Shakespeare was, though not so good at the plays. Even his grave was a bit of a joke, as he asked to be buried upright because he couldn't afford a full-length grave. So I suppose that means that come the Day of Judgment, he'll just pop straight up like the Demon King in the pantomime. It isn't fanciful, because when they were digging this grave in 1849, the gravedigger saw two shin bones upright in the sand and Johnson's skull came tumbling down into the grave which is more Hamlet than Ben Johnson Henry VII's chapel, of course the architecture um, is uh, very different uh, to what you saw uh, whilst you were in the uh, nave of the church if you look up uh, you'll see the uh, architecture drastically changes uh, to the uh, perpendicular uh, straight the way up to the, this magnificent uh, uh, fan vaulting of the sea. Now, like English O zamanki kral 7. Henry burada bakıyor eski burada bakıyor eski Deben notar el techo. Este tipo de techo solamente se ve en Inglaterra. Recuerdan cuando en Cambridge en mencionado el estilo inglés perpendicular gótico. Se encuentra solamente Now the flags here belong to the Knights of the Order of the Bar. An honor given to military people and civil servants who have done deeds for their country. Yes, but for all the stalls and banners and helmets, it's just a lot of middle-aged men who've done well behind a desk. But then, most things are nowadays, and no ladies, of course. The story uh, behind it is that the um, soldiers, before they went into battle, had a bath first, uh, before they were given this very high accolade or decoration. But now it's a, an act of, a, of pageantry and there's an installation every four years uh, to install a new living knight. You only have to think about the knights of old in battle, cased in armour from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet, galloping towards you with a nasty looking object in their hand. Heraldry was the one chance you had to extend your life if you were quick and accurate. If you get it wrong Each stall today, uh, in this uh, chapel, there is a uh, stall here for a living knight and above the actual stall hangs uh, the uh, banner um, which is for the individual living knight. The, uh, Plates at the back of the stall, uh, well, they are for um, each knight, um, their coats of arms of each individual knight, and although there are several um, plates there, they are the past uh, knights of the order. I say they are living because if anything unfortunately happens to the knights, the bath between uh, the last installation and the next one. Turning She had to practice for weeks just to hold her head up. I think she was very grateful she never had to wear that crown again. One minute silence. Then I come back to you, okay? I invite you to join with me in just one minute of prayer, standing or sitting, whichever you find most helpful or convenient. But please be quite still as we pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day... Every hour on the hour, visitors are reminded that the Abbey isn't just a museum of peculiar antiquities or a gallery of sculpture, but is primarily a house of God, in the hope and the conviction that he doesn't seem an antiquity too.
Thank you. At half past 12, in just a half an hour's time, Holy Communion will be celebrated here in the nave of the Abbey Church. You are all most welcome to join in that service. The Abbey, certainly in its tombs and monuments, is very much a church of the establishment, the rich, the powerful, the famous. But there's always been an alternative tradition here. In Poets' Corner there are Milton, Shelley and Blake, none of them creatures of the establishment. And here is Charles James Fox, dissolute, a gambler, a republican, a fighter for the abolition of the slave trade, and a darling of the public, who paid his debts twice over. He is Attlee, Ernest Bevin, and over there Archbishop Deuce de Blanc, the opponent of apartheid. All of them, in their different ways, members of the awkward squad. And were the Abbey run as the country is run, they would not get a mention here. But this, thank God, is an independent place. Conformity will not get you in, nor money, nor bullying. It is indeed a peculiar. Good. If you'd like the candles. Then. On the whole. Um, Gerald Manley Hopkins, he was practically mad, wasn't he, honestly? That's a pathetic life. Do you think so? Well, he had such a ghastly time um, with the Roman Catholic Church, you know, well, they yeah, wouldn't let him write poetry. I know, but he, he, he didn't have to join them, did he? No, but I think he was a terrible man. I mean, I think perhaps there is. Henry James was totally mad at the end. He thought he was Napoleon. Yes, but we're all, last. They're all a bit rather peculiar, really. Oh, if you examine... And Orden is very peculiar, quite honestly. Yes. Well, I mean, you know, I think these June geniuses, they just are a little bit queer, as all you can say. But Elliot, I knew Elliot quite queer. well, and he was so bold. That's what Virginia Woolf said. Well, he was. He's a sort of pinstripe man, wasn't he? Mm. Yes, he really was a pinstripe. What Virginia Woolf actually said was, here comes Tom Elliott in his four-piece suit. Ladies and gentlemen, may I just have your attention for a moment, particularly those of you who are our visitors this morning. We are about to lay a wreath on the tomb of Alfred, Lord Tennyson. And I know that members of the Tennyson Society would be only too pleased if you wanted to join us here in Poets Corner. In 1199 I call on Lord Tennyson to lay the wreath on the tomb of Alfred Lord Tennyson. Whoops, wrong grave. May I just say how enormously proud I am of my dear great grandfather, the poet. He made so very many people so very happy with his wonderful poems. I want to say also that I am so very proud of the Tennyson Society who form the major part of this dear congregation. Thank you all for coming, and God bless you all.
It's well, so nice to be here. Yeah, I'm very proud of you to have yeah, conducted the operation. It's Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you. I know long ago, you see, I'm the only, I was Belinda Ritchie, and my grandmother was, no, Anne Thatcher Ritchie. Was you knew her? Yes. I remember both of you as little boys, ages ago. Yeah, really? But fun enough, I've just been to, we go to Freshwater. Yeah. My grandmother yeah. lived at the porch, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And now the wonderful thing is that Dimbala yeah. is this, um, oh, of course, you know Elizabeth Hutchings, don't you? Yeah. So you're going off to have a lunch? Yes. You're not coming no. with us? No, I'm no. not actually. I'm going to um, uh, one of my colleagues, his wife has just had a baby, has been baptised uh, uh, just round the corner. Chuffing so there's a, there's a lunch for the new member of the Abbey family. Well, yeah. that's always exciting, isn't yeah. it? So on this September morning, when in this place of tombs the Abbey family has a new baby, we come to what is the most famous tomb of all. There's not much democracy in the Abbey, which is above all a place of names. Most of them the names of the great and the powerful. But the most famous and the most emulated grave is of someone who has no name at all. The notion of the tomb of an unknown warrior was that of David Railton, an army chaplain in the First War, and it was taken up enthusiastically by the then Dean of Westminster, Dean Ryle, though there were some misgivings in high places. The body was brought from France with elaborate precautions to ensure its anonymity, and buried here, just inside the west door, on November the 11th, 1920. No one else had ever been buried at this spot, and digging down, they came straight away to the sand and gravel of Thorny Island. Then the coffin was put in and filled with soil that had been brought from the various battlefields in France. A precise reversal of the Rupert Brook poem will be some corner of a foreign field that will be forever England. The corner of the foreign field is here. The burial itself was not auspicious, crowded as the stone itself is crowded, with obvious dignitaries and a clutch of those generals and field marshals whose boneheadedness had probably helped to put this soldier in the grave in the first place. But in time, such accretions fell away, and though this is a routine stopping point for heads of state, its associations have always been popular and pacific. The notion of the unknown warrior retaining its power simply because he could be anybody. Unlike the cenotaph, which is just up the road, which is and means an empty tomb, it has come to house our conflicting attitudes to war. The services at the cenotaph under the cold eyes of Earl Haig, somehow seeming to celebrate what they also deplore. The morning here, though, is unambiguous, and bedded down behind his little hedge, this soldier outranks whoever else is buried here. This is the most honoured grave in the Abbey. All other graves can be walked over, but not his.